In today's video, we'll be looking at feints, specifically how they fit into the tactical picture and how we can improve our feints by leveraging certain body mechanics. We'll begin by looking at some basic fencing theory. If you've been fencing for any length of time, it's very likely you've encountered the tactical wheel. This is the simple version, which we'll be using for now. As we know from experience, simple or direct attacks are rarely a reliable way of scoring a touch on our opponent. This is because they're rather easily parried, and in fact defeated by the next element of the tactical wheel, the parry and the riposte. In turn, if we notice our opponent is prone to parrying and riposting, we can overcome this with the use of compound attacks, in this case, feints. The breakdown of the feint itself is quite simple. We begin in a position where neither fencer has an advantage. We perform a feint attack, which draws our opponent's guard and exposes an opening. Then we exploit this opening with an attack carried out to its conclusion. When seen from the front, it's obvious that the opponent has both protection and threat under normal circumstances. When I perform the feint, it draws the guard, which presents an opportunity, in this case their arm, which I can then exploit, in this case with a high cut four underneath. An effective feint is about presenting a credible threat, so simply moving the arm won't usually do the trick. We can add a little bit of foot movement, which can draw the eye, which can help a little, but what we really need to do is use our whole body to seem as if we're about to attack our opponent. Here we lean in, sudden movement, it looks like we're coming forward, though it's important that we don't actually lunge when we perform the feint in any way. We can see this difference when we consider redirections. Redirections are when you are actually moving forward when you perform the initial attack, and then you direct to another area. These are generally considered bad fencing in Sabre, as they're highly susceptible to time attacks, stop thrusts, and so on. A quick note about distance. When you perform a feint, it's safest to attack the parts of the body that are closest to you. So the primary targets are the right arm and the right leg, followed by the body and head, and then finally anything further back than that. This target proximity can actually help when deciding what sort of feint to use, as we'll see soon. So let's talk about angles of attack. What is the best angle to attack from when we're initiating our feint? Left, right, low, high? The answer depends on context. In most cases, we want to draw the strongest possible guard in one direction and expose the best and closest target in a different direction. For a right-hander, we've already seen that the right arm and the right leg are closest, so we want to perform the feint that exposes those the most. So, we know we want the strongest reaction possible. Let's consider how we naturally defend ourselves in a defensive situation. When we flinch, we engage the biggest muscle groups that will react the quickest, so we might go up high with our hands to cover our head, or right in front of ourselves to cover our face or body. For a right-handed opponent in Tierce, this means the strongest reactions come to the inside line, into cart, into high cart, and into preem, all of which massively expose the lead arm. We draw this guard with a powerful feint to the inside line. From here, usually we're cutting over the blade to the outside line, in this case, the arm would be the highest percentage, or possibly the head. Here we've drawn high cart, exposing the arm for a cut over, or even a powerful cut four underneath. And finally, if they come up into a high hanging in the form of preem, it's extraordinarily easy to cut over to the forearm, though the flank is also possible. Notice that left-handers have a number of other opportunities here. Left-handers will often cut underneath to your inside line, straight up the middle to the forearm, or hitting the leg on the inside. They also have a naturally very strong cut to your outside line because that's on their favourable side. Of course, no matter whether you're left or right-handed, an experienced fencer will rarely overreact to your initial feint, and will often get the second parry on as well. In this case, we have to look out for structural weaknesses instead. Sometimes the opponent's hand goes too low and leaves an exposure of the head with the blade crossing the body. In this case, a high powerful cut with good opposition will actually glissade down the blade, displacing it further, allowing us to hit our opponent. Because the arm is well covered, it's harder to hit with this glissade, so paradoxically, it's actually easier to hit a deeper target. Even if the opponent's hand is slightly higher, this opportunity is still there. A steep cut down the blade can glissade down, displacing and hitting the head. If the opponent's second parry is too high, this affords a totally different opportunity. In this case, their forearm is exposed, and their head is covered, so we can cut around with a cut 6, or even a cut 4 under to the arm. Notice we could also attack the leg here, but that always risks a powerful afterblow, which we don't want. Finally, if you're fighting a backsword or a broadsword, you may find they punch out with their guard, so their forearm is susceptible to a cut 4 under. 
One of the techniques that people often forget to take advantage of is the feint on the riposte. The typical paradigm for the return attack is to attack directly as quickly as possible before the opponent has time to withdraw or to effectively defend themselves. Feint ripostes by comparison have a slight delay. We parry, we perform a feint as the opponent withdraws, and then we cut over to the opening wherever that may be. Parry, feint, cut to the opening. Feint ripostes are especially useful against opponents who run away as they recover and parry. Here we parry as usual. Our opponent, who's probably French, runs away a little further than normal. In this case, our feint is actually performed on the forward movement of an advanced lunge. This is one of the few occasions in which we actually move forward as part of the feint cut itself. And finally, we cut over, in this case with cut two. Parry, feint attack, cut over. Parry, feint, cut over. Finally, there's the topic of the double feint. Like the advancing feint on the riposte, the double feint is useful against those who run away as they defend. Here I feint cut two and the opponent immediately springs back. Notice once again that I'm performing the initial feint on the first foot movement of an advanced lunge. I haven't yet moved my body forward, but I have kicked my foot out. Staying on the heel as I come forward, I perform the second feint, this time a cut one. This puts me at the correct measure for a normal lunge. And that's what I do, with the final cut over attacking the forearm. Again in isolation, feint one, feint two, cut, this time to the leg, and then recover. And with that, we come to the end of our investigation into feints. So in summary, first, on the tactical wheel, feints are used to defeat parry riposts. Second, angle your feints to draw the strongest parrying reaction from your opponent. Third, attack the closest target on opponents who overreact. Or fourth, take advantage of structural weaknesses in any opponent who quickly defends themselves. Use feints on the riposte to take advantage of a disorderly recovery. And finally, use double feints on an opponent who runs away. And there you have it. Thanks for watching.